go. So thank you, everybody. I know we'll um, be expecting some people to uh, continue arriving, and, and that's OK. We'll just go ahead and get started with some of the opening uh, comments. And so welcome, everybody. And thank you for being here tonight. Uh, tonight's event is a special author reading and conversation. And um, we'll tell you a little bit more about what that's about in just a moment. My name is Katie Porter, and I'm executive director of Inlandia Institute. And for those uh, who don't know what Inlandia is, we are a 501c3 nonprofit focused on the literary and cultural arts in inland Southern California. And uh, before we formally begin, Inlandia Institute respectfully acknowledges and recognizes our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air the Kauia, Tongva, Luiseno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, the Inlandia region is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, and we express our gratitude to them for allowing us the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Uh, so tonight's presentation is One Community, Many Voices, and it is made possible with funding from California Humanities, a partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And this project was initiated and is moderated tonight by Inlandia Literary Laureate, Rachel Cruz, who is also the project coordinator for this project. And we will be featuring authors, Joshua Jennifer Espinoza, who is a poet, and Alex Espinoza, who is a novelist, and also joining us will be Richard T. Rodriguez, who is an advisor to this project. So let's just get a, a quick hello from everybody. Um, Rachel, would you like to say hi? Let's see. Sure, hi. Thank you so much for that introduction, Katie. And, um, uh, welcome everybody to this event, One Community, Many Voices. Um, I'm really excited about this project. Um, it was one of the first projects that I wanted to do as the Inlandia Literary Laureate um, when I was uh, part, when I became the laureate in 2018. And so I'm really excited to have um, Jennifer Espinosa and Alex Espinosa, the powerhouse of Espinosas <laughs> tonight. Um, I'm really excited to hear them both read and to share their work with you. And, um, you know, I hope that we can have a lively discussion and if folks um, hear lines that they love or they have questions, I think there's a Q&A button, um, but I love seeing uh, what resonates with folks in the chat, so, um, or in the Q&A. So um, thank you all for being here. And I think that's it for me for right now. Yeah, well, welcome Rachel and thank you so much for that introduction of the powerhouse. So let's see one of our powerhouse writers and let's see. Whoop, did I put it back on Rachel? Oops, let's go back to Jennifer. There we go. Hi, Jennifer, thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, uh, thank you all for everyone who's attending. Thank you for being here. And uh, thank you to Inlandia, Katie, um, Rachel, um, for helping put this together. And I'm just so happy to be here and so excited to be reading with Alex, who um, is a very talented writer. And I know from having taken a class with him this uh, earlier this year. Um, so I'm very excited to be back here in this space with him and with all of you. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing some of my poems with you a little later. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And Alex Espinoza, would you like to say hi? Sure, hi everyone. Um, I was able to successfully unmute myself without causing too much of a, of a, of a panic. Um, I will get this Zoom thing down eventually. Yeah. Um, it's great to be here. Um, thank you to Katie, to Rachel for having this amazing idea. I think it's a wonderful um, a project. I think it's a needed project. 
Thank you to Ricky, um, Kimmy, and everyone who's uh, who's been um, you know uh, supporting this and and supporting writers. Uh, my first one of the first um, pieces that I had published when my uh, novel came out was an anthology that was um, put out by Inlandia, uh, and um, I, I remember the thrill of that of seeing my name in that anthology representing the IE. So I'm really happy to see how Inlandia as an institute has flourished over the years. And it's a joy to be back at, UC, at the UC Riverside community uh, as a you know, professor and um, teaching people like, like, like Jennifer, being able to have these wonderful classes and conversations. So thank you everyone for being here and it's, it's a delight. Well, thank you. And yes, I remember that was the flagship anthology, the Inlandia anthology that got us started um, and next, I'd like to introduce Ricky Rodriguez to say hello. And uh, hi, Ricky. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to participate um, in the star-studded lineup of, of writers and thinkers. And um, Inlandia uh, is just an amazing project. And to be able to contribute to it in some small part uh, means the world to me. So I'm looking forward to engaging with you about two amazing books um, and hopefully generating a great deal of conversation and, uh, about these brilliant writers who we're lucky to have in our presence. So thank you. Thank you, Ricky. And thank you for agreeing to be our humanities advisor for this program. Um, as Rachel mentioned, there's a Q&A box at the bottom. There's also the chat box. If you have questions that you want to ask at any time, please put it in the Q&A box. Or if you want to um, start a conversation, use the chat for that. And uh, without further ado, I want to turn it over to Rachel to uh, introduce our first reader and tell you a little more about her vision for the project. Welcome, Rachel. Thanks, Katie. So um, I remember meeting Jennifer in the hallway at UCR on the third floor and I remember I just read her book and I was like that's that's her <laughs> that's Jennifer and um and it's funny because I've taught Jennifer's work um a few times throughout the years and I remember one of my students being at back to the grind with Jennifer's book in hand and then turning around and seeing Jennifer <laughs> and so I just thought that was amazing that we have this incredible um, wealth of writers here in the Inland Empire um, from Riverside, from Southern California. And I think sometimes the Inland Empire, um, you know, when looking at the literary community, it can be painted over or thought of as homogenous, but it's not. Um, and I think it's really important um, for projects like these to really emphasize uh, queer and trans voices, especially queer and trans voices of color. Um, and I heard, I just want to talk quickly a little bit about Alex because I heard about Alex before I met Alex. <laughs> and I remember the buzz on campus when um, we heard about Alex coming into the creative writing department at UCR. And I read Alex's book and I was like thrilled um, to have him and to meet him um, and to be a part of the community with him. And so um, you know, this project is really just amplifying uh, the writers here um, on campus here at UCR, but in the Inland Empire um, and showing that like we have um, a lot of folks who are, um, you know, up and coming and writing and publishing, working with young people, uh, working with families to get their work um, out there. And I think um, my hope for a project like this is just to continue um, to show that representation. Um, and to show that, um, you know, the literary community is not a monolith in the Inland Empire um, and that these writers have been writing, right? They've been, you know, both Alex and Joshua, J Jennifer Espinosa have books, you know, multiple books under their belts. So um, I think that's it. Um, and I'm really excited to be here um, and just to be um, a facilitator for this project and um, if folks don't already know, uh, their books are available at the Riverside and San Bernardino County and Public Libraries for free. Um, you just need to contact your librarian, 
your local librarian and arrange a pickup time that works best for you. And um, as a result, we will um, have discussion uh, sessions over Zoom. And I just wanna give a shout out to our discussion leaders, um, Serena Trujillo, uh, Kini Sosa, uh, Lucas Lopez, who are uh, leading discussions on Jennifer's book specifically. And then we'll have another set of discussion leaders for Alex's book in the spring. So I hope you come join us. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think, you know, nowadays there is, so I know I have a yearning for community. And so um, when I have conversations with um, folks in the community about literature, it just makes me feel less alone. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rachel. I'm so glad to have you here and so proud of the kinds of projects that you have curated through your laureateship. Um, at this point, would you like to introduce Jennifer to begin the reading? Yes, <laughs> thank <Great>. you. <laughs> Thanks for keeping me on task, Katie. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm really thrilled and honored to introduce Joshua Jennifer Espinosa, who is a trans woman poet living in California. Her work has been published in Poetry Magazine, The Paris Review, Denver Quarterly, Lambda Literary, Pen America, The Offing, and elsewhere. She is the author of There Should Be Flowers, which is the book we are um, spotlighting for this project. Outside of the body, there's something like hope, and I'm alive, it hurts, I love it. And please welcome Jennifer. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that introduction, Rachel. I really appreciate that. Um, I think in the keeping with the spirit of, of this discussion and this kind of being centered around this text, I'll just be reading um, directly from the book. And um, I'm just gonna kind of start at the beginning and kind of move through whatever feels right. Um, and I hope you all enjoy this. Thank you again for being here. It is important to be something. This is like a life. This is lifelike. I climb inside a mistake and remake myself in the shape of a better mistake. A nice pair of glasses without any lenses. Shoes that don't quite fit. A chest that always hurts. There's a checklist of things you need to do to be a person. I don't want to be a person, but there isn't a choice. So I work my way down and kiss the feet. I work my way up and lick the knee. I give you my skull to do with whatever you please. You grow flowers from my head and trim them too short. I paint my nails nice and pretty, and who cares? Who gives a shit? I'm trying not to give a shit, but it doesn't fit well on me. I wear my clothes. I wear my body. I walk out in the grass and turn red at the sight of everything. I dream of horses eating cops. I dream of horses eating cops. I have so much hope for the future, or no, I don't. Who knows the sound a head makes when it is asleep? My dad was a demon, but so was the white man in uniform who harassed him for the crime of being brown. There are demons everywhere, dad said, and he was right, but not in the way that he meant it. The sky over San Bernardino was a brilliant blue when the winds kicked in. All the fences and trash cans and smog scattered themselves and the mountains were on fire every day. I couldn't wait to die or be killed my woman body trapped in a dream. I couldn't wait to wake up and ride off into the sunset, but there isn't much that's new anywhere. The same violence swallows itself and produces bodies and names for bodies. I name my body girl of my dreams. I name my body proximity. I name my body full of hope despite everything. I name my body dead girl who hasn't died yet. I hope I come back as an elephant. I hope we all come back as animals and eat our fill. I hope everyone gets everything they deserve. There should be flowers. There should be more to life than disruption and survival, but there isn't. There should be birds singing your name. There should be paintings the size of skyscrapers memorializing your body. There should be love for you in everything. There should be a billion women jumping at the same time to move the earth off its course. There should be parties to celebrate the end of this world. There should be flowers to welcome a new one.
autopainophile. My favorite thing is slowly pulling into my parking spot at home, just as the song I've been feeling things to finally ends. All these movie moments and hand cutting wind in half dreams come for me as if sent by some light that wants to watch me survive. In the movies, people like me don't survive and it's the same in real life. So I make my own movies in my head and I last till the end and I am not happy even in my own fantasy, but I'm strong. I'm holding the camera and pointing it at myself. So I'm trapped in my own gaze, which is fine, which feels great which is like the taste of my own blood, which is great. I wish I loved my body the way you say I love my body. And I wish the sun would stay just below the horizon forever. I imagine all my cis friends laughing at tranny jokes. I imagine all my cis friends laughing at tranny jokes whenever I'm not around. I can hear the sound of rain outside and I'm grasping for the words to say this. There is nothing I love more than an honest storm, broken dishes, dead grass. The time has come for me to be alive and for you to stop speaking. Please stop speaking. Please, oh please stop speaking. I have never felt as alone as this, I say every day. I have never felt so alone. I've built houses in corners of houses and filled them with all of my longings, my strength, my pride, my beauty, my woman self. I read another comment section of an article about trans women and I want to die, to not exist, to let them win. I don't let them win. I circle the drain and kiss my fingers hello. I welcome them back. This complex trauma responds only to the dialectical, only to the heat and the cool, the death and the life. Only then is it lifted for a moment to let me breathe. I breathe the sweet air and I stare at the hillside and then at the road and then at the cars and then at the sky, also unsure of themselves, also softly shaking in place, also beautifully living. Comfort. 11 a.m., I'm to wake up. Muscles sore, jaw clenched, warm light scattering dreams of violence across the bedroom. I've chosen a self too large for this body, too willing to change for others, too beautiful to appear in public. I tell you to walk in my feet, but they're all I have left. I've been weathered down to the ankles by all the news reports, all the listening, all the not doing. When I crawl out of bed, I don't know where to go, what to say. I tried to talk about comfort, but how do you describe a color you've never been allowed to see? Wrapped in my body, I dream. Wrapped in my body, I dream of being something else outside of time, space, energy, love, death, gender, capitalism, etc. Who could lift such a weight? Not me. I am one thing, after all, sucking on its own poisons. The idea I could or should be beautiful. The song of songs that sings itself to sleep. The thought of heaven without a hell. The whisper of life without a death. The dream of salvation without blood. My first love. My first love was silence. I built myself from scratch and no one listened. This was the best time of my life. I used, to, I used to carry the clothes to the laundry room and pray for all the fog in the world to surround me. I'd let my thoughts catch rides with the passing planes. All that womanhood caught in the roof of my mouth was like honey. I knew it would never go bad, so I never said a word about it. I am draped in heavenly skin. I am draped in heavenly skin from head to toe. Back then, they said you could never be the girl you know yourself to be. I knew too much about myself to stay alive. I stayed alive. I wrote names on my body with pins, nails, knives, fire, anything that would mark the flesh. This kind of violence is a shrine to itself. The way it touches you without breathing, thinking, feeling. What is left of me? The songs I sang to keep from sleeping sound like nothing more than rain. I woke up this morning a garden. I took pictures of all of my flowers. I was beautiful as far as I could tell.
This poem is a personal essay. This poem is a personal essay. I love to feel crowded by the leaves in my hands and the birds in my mouth. There is so much time for me to get better. No, there isn't. I've only ever seen the sky open once and I didn't get to kiss it. I always want to say who cares when I mean to say I care. This is not my only flaw. In the shower, a universe slides off me and five more take its place. Like a good woman. Like a good woman, I apologize. We are all approximations of what we are. I said I would never again be anyone's crumbs, but here I am eating dust and late afternoon sunlight for your amusement. I won't say anything else about it. There are trees outside my window filled with dozens of hummingbirds. I want to offer them the sugar from my tongue because they would never think to ask for it. Wind poem number one. I am saying I and walking up some hillside where my body becomes wind and I love wind and I am so happy and sad. I would live another year if for no other reason than to feel it again. I believe in ritual. I listen to myself in the car with the window halfway down. I imagine I'd fly out and tumble down the road like a scrap of trash. I'd be the cutest piece of trash in this city. Instead, I wash my hands and train my voice to sound like soft gusts against cold glass. I push a lawnmower over my chin. I paint my face with white and red and white and more white. I draw black lines to highlight separation. I pull my body inside out and fall in love with the feeling of not dying. All of this labor is like some kind of prayer to prove I deserve to exist in these spaces, to prove I deserve to exist in space, to prove I deserve to exist. Growth ritual. It's 10 a.m. somewhere. My uncles are children blushing in the grass, unaware of who I've become. I haven't heard God whisper anything in my ear in many years. Not since I lived in that old house and slept in mom's old bedroom where the sun baked the wall against the bed. I woke up every morning with my head on fire, 1,000 panic attacks a month, dangling roots scattering dirt all across the floor, my body rebuilding itself from the sky up. I forgot where I was. I forgot where I was. It was June 1st and the air was dying. I had empathy for the dirt as it consumed the grass. I played games on my phone until the world became a fogged up window. Where was I again? The body, yes, the body. It moves like nothing else ever has. Something in you had to die before you could inhabit your body. I can feel what it is when I wake up sober for the first time in a month. Dreams are always tainted by ideas of what dreams should be. Don't tell me anything. I'm here, I'm here, I exist. Thank God I remember how small I am. You are a tree in yourself. You are a tree in yourself in your garden. The world calls the dream of your body into question. Your skin gets drawn out over the muscle of the sky. Feelings come to remind you that you might exist. When you cry, you are saying I love you to yourself. But there is history. There is time. There are forces at work in your chest and in your room and in your house and in your public and in the looks on the faces of those who narrate your body when they see you. So much is leaving you when you give yourself to the world. When you walk, the ground seems to breathe you out. A 
a guide to reading trans literature. We're dying and we're really sad. We keep dying because trans women are supposed to die. This is sad. I don't have the words for my body. So I'll say I'm a cloud or a mountain or something pretty that people enjoy. So if I die, people will be like, oh, that's sad. Be sad about that. It's okay to be sad. It's sad when people die. It is sad when people want to die. I sometimes want to die, but I don't. I'm one of the lucky ones. You can feel happy about that. It's okay to feel happy about that. Now, pretend this is very serious. History doesn't exist. My body doesn't exist. There is nothing left for you to be complicit in. It's okay for you to feel happy about that. Now, pretend I am crying right in front of you, opening that wound up just for you. Now pretend you can feel my pain. Now pretend something in you has been moved, has been transformed. Now pretend you are absolved. I'm gonna read two more. Um, thank you all so much for, for bearing with me through this. Um, I haven't read some of these poems out loud in quite a while, so I hope I'm not too rusty. Um, but this is really great so far. I, I appreciate you all. On being outed to my family. While I am speaking to you about the sadness of distance, the phone buzzes against my ear and I ignore it. It isn't until later that I read the text and find I've been outed to my family. I'm stuck thinking about the violence of closeness, all that blood. I used to dream about dad as a monster materializing out of the dark light of squeezed eyelids. And now dreaming just feels obsolete. I need a drink. I need something worthless. I need love that isn't contingent upon some kind of loss. I'm a thousand miles from home in my head and my body is making more and more sense. It makes so much sense to be this thing. The more it kills me, the more sense it makes. I am against everything. And I mean that as in skin. And I mean that as in resistance. It doesn't hurt like you'd think it would. Sure, we all suffer. Sure, we all die. This is a given. I want to suffer for as long as I can because it means I am living. So I'll suffer the words. I'll suffer the stringing, the stinging strings of text. I'll suffer the loneliness of being alone with my head. I'll suffer my own voice, coarse and just slightly too deep and dripping over the edges of the girl I was supposed to be. I'll suffer the sadness of distance. I'll suffer the violence of proximity. I'll suffer the body I have and the body I don't have. I'll suffer the blood. I'll suffer the song you sing when you see me walking as though I didn't build these legs myself. I'll suffer the dial tone. I'll suffer the static. I'll suffer the poem I have to write just to make sense of all this suffering. And the poem is like the sun. I can't even look at it. It doesn't matter and I don't care. No, I care and it matters, but it can't and I won't let it. I left a fire and a storm back in Southern California and I can't wait to come home to you and the mud and the ash. Okay, last poem. The moon is trans. The moon is trans. From this moment forward, the moon is trans. You don't get to write about the moon anymore unless you respect that. You don't get to talk to the moon anymore unless you use her correct pronouns. You don't get to send men to the moon anymore unless their job is to bow down before her and apologize for the sins of the earth. She is waiting for you, pulling at you softly, telling you to shut the fuck up already, please. Scientists theorize the moon was once a part of the earth that broke off when another planet struck it. Eve came from Adam's rib, etc. Do you believe in the power of not listening to the inside of your own head? I believe in the power of you not listening to the inside of your own head. This is all upside down. We should be talking about the ways that blood is similar to the part of outer space between the earth and the moon, but we're busy drawing it instead. The moon is often described as dead, though she is very much alive. The moon has not known the feeling of not wanting to be dead for any extended period of time in all of her existence, but she's not delicate and she is not weak. 
She is constantly moving away from you the only way she can. She never turns her face from you because of what you might do. She will outlive everything you know. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was incredible. I honestly could sit here uh, for hours listening to you read. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, um, but um, I want to make sure to uh, introduce Ricky Rodriguez, who will um, introduce Alex next. Hello, everyone. I just want to say thanks to Jennifer again. Uh, your work is so amazing, and I agree with Rachel. I could sit here and listen to your poems um, forever, but so thanks. And I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next uh, reader, writer, um, Alex Espinosa, who I've admired uh, for quite a, quite a while now. Um, and I'm gonna give you a, a bio of Alex, uh, just to give you a little sense of who he is. Uh, he was born in Tijuana, Mexico, to, to parents from the state of Michoacan and raised in suburban Los Angeles. In high school and afterwards, he worked a series of retail jobs. And I love this about Alex because we have this in common. Um, as far as working retail, uh, he sold everything from eggs and milk to used appliances, custom furniture, rock t-shirts, and body jewelry. Uh, after graduating from the University of California, Riverside, he's a UCR alumni, yeah. alum. Um, he went on to earn an MFA in the prestigious UC Irvine program in creative writing. Um, his first novel, uh, Stillwater Saints, was published by Random House uh, in 2007. And I have a copy here just to give you, um, if you haven't picked up your copy already. Um, <laughs> um, and it was named a Barnes and Noble uh, Discover Great New Writers Selection. Um, his second novel, The Five Acts of Diego Leon, was published by Random House as well in March, 2013. And his newest book is Cruising, which is right here. Um, I don't think you can see it, unfortunately, uh, with this uh, virtual <laughs> background that I have. Um, but it was published uh, last year in June 2019. Um, and it's an amazing book. Um, check it out if you can. Uh, Alex is deeply involved with the Puente Project, uh, which is a program designed to help first generation community colleges, college students uh, make a successful transition to the university. And he was a Puente student himself and has ser since served as a mentor and often visits classes to talk with students and teachers about writing, uh, literature, and the opportunities he gained through education. Um, and as we mentioned before, he is currently the Tomas Rivera Endowed Chair of Creative Writing at UC Riverside. Uh, it's a great honor to have him as a colleague um, and a great honor to have him here uh, this evening. Uh, so without further ado, um, Alex Espinosa. Uh, thank you, Ricky, for that wonderful introduction. That's incredibly sweet. Um, it's always very humbling. And, and I have to say that, you know, Ricky, I, I'd followed your work too for, for, for years before I, um, I, I met you. I think, I think we met at a, at a restaurant in um, Chicago for, it was AWP, or not AWP, MLA. Um, so, um, so that was, that was a while ago. We were very, we were both in very different places, I think at that, uh, at that time. And um, it, it's such a pleasure for me to, uh, to also be able to call you colleague and to be uh, back giving to a university and a program that, that gave me so much. And, and now I can say, you know, being able to have worked with uh, Jennifer last quarter in our class and, getting to know Rachel and just seeing the, um, and the sort of the blossoming of, of Inlandia uh, after so many years of being away, it's, it's so nice to be back, to be able to see what, what the amazing uh, university community and the writing community at, at UCR has managed uh, to do. When I was a student at UCR, um, a creative writing major, we were 60. <laughs> there were 60 of us that were majors. It was a tiny major. And uh, I came to UC Riverside uh, as a transfer student. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I, uh, the first class I took was Susan Strait's beginning uh, fiction writing class. And I um, started writing stories. I started writing pretty bad stories. 
uh, people would die in all my stories. Like Susan would uh, had to pull me aside at one point and say, is everything okay? Cause like you keep killing people in your stories. Like people don't have to die. And it was a revelation for me to realize like, oh, what, well, what are they gonna do? And she would say, well, they'd maybe go out for coffee or you know, they can um, talk to each other. They don't, they don't have to, that, there doesn't have to be this cataclysmic end. I learned a lot. I was working at the mall um, at the gallery at Tyler off the 91. I was an assistant manager at Hot Topic. Uh, and it was Hot Topic during the time that, you know, we sold uh, a lot of body jewelry and gothic capes and all of that stuff. And um, I was writing stories that would become this book when I would come home in the middle of the night. And um, I started this novel at UC Riverside and it was my senior thesis. And then when I went on to teach, when I went on to, to graduate school at UC Irvine, uh, it became the project that, um, that I, I developed. And more than anything, what I wanted to do with this is I really wanted to give a literary identity to the Inland Empire, to a place that I think oftentimes, as Rachel said, gets glossed over or overlooked or completely misrepresented. And um, that was my aim, was to be able to sort of put it on the map and I was fortunate enough to have um, lots of really wonderful teachers and mentors. And um, it's such a joy to be able to, to, to be back at UC Riverside as Tomas Rivera chair. Um, so, um, and, and follow us by the way, on Twitter and Instagram, we have a great conference lined up. Uh, we have a bunch of wonderful writers that are gonna be coming next quarter. So um, uh, I'm gonna read you a couple of short sections from this book. And I just have to say, um, Following uh, Jennifer is going to be a hard gig. Um, Jennifer did a fantastic job, uh, and it was it's such a treat to be able to read alongside uh, one of my one of my former students who shares my last name. Um, my novel takes place in the fictional community of Aguamansa, and uh, Aguamansa would I should I shouldn't say fictional. Aguamansa was an actual place that was founded in the 1840s by a group of settlers who came out from Abiquiu, New Mexico. And in 1860, uh, the river, the Santa Ana River overflowed its banks and the community was washed away. And um, those people never resettled. So in sort of my fiction, um, that flood never happened. And the community of Aguamansa uh, survived and managed to become uh, a community just like any other community. So, um, and it focuses mainly on Berla, a woman who runs a small botanica in a rundown strip mall in Aguamansa, and some of the customers who come to see her uh, to procure var various items like herbs, teas, spells, uh, a bunch of different things. Um, I'm going to read you a very short section, and it takes place in the very beginning. It was time to close now. Bedla began where she always did, dusting the figure of San Antonio, who stood guard on the wooden table by the front window. She took a bottle of ammonia and using a crumpled up sheet of newspaper wiped down the window's glass. She straightened the statues displayed on the right hand wall and made sure they all faced forward. She organized the shelves of soaps and oils, bath salts and incense sticks. Some of the pigs on the wall were empty so she grabbed some herbs from the back to fill in the gaps. She rearranged the gems and crystals, the books and decks of tarot cards and the amulets and pendants, the rosaries and crucifixes inside the glass case where the register sat. She took inventory in her binder, noting which candles were low, what packets of incense sticks had sold, what herbs and teas she was missing and set the list by the phone. She locked the door then closed out the register, separating her starting fund for tomorrow and recounting it before putting it back into the drawer. She took the rest of the money and placed it in a metal cash box. And tucking this under her arm, she walked to the broom closet next to the bathroom. The closet was cramped, only wide enough for one bucket and two mops. She bent down to hide the box under the loose floorboard then pushed the bucket over the spot. She filled a glass bowl with tap water from the sink in the kitchenette and returned to the front of the store. She looked at all the stones, lapis, limestone, tourmaline, displayed right there in the case. Removing a piece of quartz, she let her fingers slide across the edges and brought it up to her nose. It carried the scent of something fossilized, of ancient oceans and extinct fishes. 
Quartz helped with concentration, with memory and enlightenment and insight. Bedla rubbed the stone three times over each eye and pressed it against the middle of her forehead, leaving it there for a minute to see if she could sense its energy before dropping it into the water. The stone tapped the edges of the bowl as she carried it toward the statue of Santa Barbara and set it on the loose, the floor besides the flowers that she'd been given. She took more statues from the shelves, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Buddha, San Simon, Vishnu. And she arranged these around Santa Barbara. She grabbed one of the fold-up chairs she kept near the door, placed it before them, and she sat down. She focused hard on their faces. She wanted them to say something. She wanted to witness them move or bleed from the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet, but nothing happened. She imagined the Botanica's counter and walls as outstretched arms, beaded with amulets and onks and silver medallions, those arms then becoming her own, gathering all of her customers in. She thought about wisdom that stretched on beyond the sky, beyond that and into death. She closed her eyes and tried to see it, to tap it, but no matter how hard she tried, nothing came. Bedla couldn't do what her customers believed that she could. She couldn't float through walls and utter strange words. She couldn't speak with the spirits of the dead. She never could, and she knew that she never would. But the old man that had given her the shop had told her she had something. She had a gift. He called it el don. It was strong in her, he'd said. And there were times that she even believed in herself. The iron security gates unfolded like the bellows of an accordion as she pulled it along the rail in the front of the door. She snapped the padlock shut and turned around the corner of the building and headed home. Her house was close, just across the empty lot next to the shopping center. Wild sage and scrub grew beside the worn path that cut through the field. Boys sometimes rode their bikes there doing tricks and wheelies as they bumped over mounds and brakes, falling down, laughing and scraping their knees, their faces coated with grime. Their tires left thin tracks that looped around the salt cedar trees, around the soiled mattresses and old washers and sinks that were dumped here. People told of a curse on these grounds, of a group of monks traveling through Aguamansa in the days when California was still a part of Mexico back before states were shapes on a map. They said that they'd been massacred, that they'd skinned them and scattered their body parts around the lot for the crows. Still others said Mexican settlers had been lynched from the branches of the cedars by Anglos who stole their land for the railroads. Seeing a piece of stone, Bedla wondered about the monks and those men dangling from the branches. A tooth, she wondered, part of a toe, Empty soda cans and wrappers were caught under boulders and discarded car parts. What would the monks think about having a tire for a headstone, she thought, or a couch for a marker? She thought of her husband, of his tombstone, of the thick green lawns of the cemetery where he was buried. When she reached her house and stepped inside, the air was warm and silent. She put her purse down on the rocking chair near the front door and went around, pushing the lace curtains back and cracking open the windows. She breathed in the scent of wood smoke from someone's fireplace on the street, a smell that reminded her of her father toasting garbanzo beans. She went into the kitchen and looked for something to eat. Dinner for Bedla was a bowl of instant oatmeal with two slices of toast, which she took out to her small patio. The night was cold and the steam from the oatmeal rose up and fogged her glasses as she spooned it in her mouth. Police sirens wailed on the street and dogs answered, their cries lonely and beautiful. She looked up and in the flashing lights saw a set of glowing red eyes. Bedla flicked on the porch light. It was an opossum, its fur dingy and gray, the tips and insides of its ears bright pink. It stood motionless behind the trunk of the organ pipe cactus, staring at her, just staring at her. 
It climbed to the top of the fence, making a low, faint jingle as it moved. She looked again. A small brass bell was tied to a piece of red yarn knotted around the opossum's tail. She didn't know why, but she took her spoon and threw it. When it hit the bottom of the fence, the animal darted, the clatter of the bell frantic. The opossum disappeared behind the branches of the avocado tree and down the other side of the fence into the empty lot, the ringing growing fainter and fainter. From under the kitchen sink, behind a pile of cloths and old sponges she could never bring herself to throw away was a bottle of rum. She poured some into a cup and took a long drink, then another, and the warmth calmed her nerves. She imagined the ghosts of the dead monks and the lynched men rising up from the ground now, awakened by her thoughts. Curls of gray smoke at first, they slowly took human form. They walked in a straight line, one in front of the other, a slow procession following the opossum's tracks through the lot and back home. She took another drink and closed her eyes. That animal, it was a messenger. It was letting her know something was out there. It was coming. She sat down and waited for it. So thank you very much. I'll stop there. Woo! <laughs> thank you, Alex. <laughs> thank you. I got chills from that. That was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I feel so privileged to be here. And I think we're going to um, give folks a minute to, people are pausing in the chat, which is lovely. Um, but if you have questions uh, for either Jennifer or Alex or both, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, but I think we are going to um, ask some questions. Are we going to unmute ourselves now and, and talk? <laughs> sure. Um, and we do have a question that was sent ahead. If you'd like, um, we could start with that. Sure. Okay. So one of our audience members um, wrote in and uh, her question is, I am now following Miss Espinosa on Twitter. My copy of her book is now marked up with all the lines I love. I wonder if she would mind if I quoted some of those lines on Twitter, um, giving the book title and tagging her in the tweet. I have several transgender friends on Twitter and I think Miss Espinosa's words would resonate with them. So how do you, how do you feel about that and people connecting with your work? I mean, not only do I not mind, and first of all, thank you. That that's such a kind uh, uh, thing to say and to, to want to do. Um, um, and like, yeah, not only do I not mind my work being shared that way, I I'm very grateful that you'd even want to do that. Um, so please definitely feel free. Um, just the fact that you, that you connected to, to, um, my writing in that way is just so, I don't know, I just, I feel so lucky um, to be able to do this and to be able to speak about my life and my experiences through my writing in a way that that allows people to connect with, um, not just like what I'm communicating, but like maybe it helps them understand like the world around them or themselves a little better. And for me, that's just, that's like the biggest gift of all um, when it comes to like sharing my writing. So thank you. <laughs> Well, she just said thank you in the chat. Um, I don't know if we have any other questions from the audience, but oh, here we, there's one popped up. Okay, Rachel, do you want to, do you want me to read it or do you want to read it? Uh, I can read it, that's fine. Um, this is from Rima, hi Rima. Um, and Rima writes, this one's for Alex. Novel work is such a labor, especially of time. Are there versions of the story that you liked better than others and felt bad about editing out or altering for the final result? Oh yeah, that's a that's a really good question. You know, what's funny is is um, when I started this book, it was initially a a, a collection of short stories, and um, I didn't envision it as a novel. So I would just write these 
stories um, centering on people who were going into this this shop to procure different things, and um, and they would all encounter Bebla, the woman that ran the shop. And it wasn't until I was in graduate school that um, I decided that I wanted to write her point of view. And I challenged myself and told myself I wanted to write it in third person. Uh, but all of the, um, the customers that would go in were all told in first person. And there were tons of, of other narratives that I had included. Uh, there was one uh, focusing on two friends, uh, two young women one had a baby and the other one was trying uh, very hard uh, to have a baby. And um, it's narrated by the friend and um, she doesn't understand why her friend is so adamant about, about becoming a, a, you know, a mother. Uh, and it, I had set up this really interesting dynamic between these two friends and um, ultimately, that was one of, the, one of the stories that we cut out. Uh, another one was a group of, of, uh, of, of friends who are um, going out on the last sort of hurrah before one of them goes off to college. And, um, and so those were edited out, and I was, I was kind of bummed. But they did find life uh, other places. Actually, the first one was the one that was uh, placed in, in Landia in the anthology. Mm. So um, it did find a sort of a, a life. So yeah, I was kind of bummed, but but then I think also ultimately, you know, when you're working with something as huge and with so many strings attached to it as a novel, you you kind of have to be willing to make some sacrifices. Ultimately, I was very proud of the book and and um, proud of 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 how it sort of stood up to the test of time. I think one of my favorite characters in the book to write of all people was um, one of my characters in the book is Sean. He's a white dude who, who talks like a Chicano and um, he's a meth addict and he's living mm. a very crazy life. And um, when I wrote that, I had no idea what I was doing. It just, it just, this voice came to me. And I remember sitting down in front of my computer and writing and at one point it was nine in the morning and then I was in my robe and in my pajamas, it was a Saturday. And then the next thing I know, I looked up at the clock and it was 3 p.m. and I was still in my robe and my pajamas writing. That's how that, that voice was so engaging. And um, the way it appears in this book is, is almost verbatim the way I wrote it. Mm. So um, that character's voice was just, there was something about him. He's so radically different from me that, that writing that character was just, it was like, I, I don't know what you're gonna say or do, um, but I'm curious to find out, so, so let's go. So that was definitely, and a lot of the, you know, the Bedla parts, like I, I really um, enjoyed spending time with Bedla. I didn't wanna make her a, a tragic figure. I wanted her to be uh, a woman who was very complex, who was aware of her situation and knew that um, she knows her community better than anybody else. So I want, I definitely wanted to make her the heart of the community. It was really, she ended up being a character that a lot of, a lot of readers have said, oh my God, you know, I, I love that character. And then she encounters this, this one boy that crosses the border. And um, a lot of readers are like, what happened to Rodrigo? What happened to him? Um, so it's interesting to see what characters people get invested in, right? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't think about that character very much. And then suddenly readers would say like, did, you know, what happened to him? Like we, you know, I don't want to give too much of the book away for those that have read it. Um, but it's really interesting to see how people react. But Bedlan, I just say Bedlan Sean were some of the more interesting ones and the, the, the most fun for me to write. That's great. And I, I see another question. Um, this one's from Kini, who's one of our discussion leaders. Um, Kini writes, for both Jennifer and Alex, how was the writing process for your bodies of work how have they changed alongside your development and identities as a writer? And I kind of want to um, add to that question of what it was, what is it like to read from your early or first book today in 2020? I know Jennifer mentioned that earlier. And, um, and so I'd be curious to hear about that. Jennifer, why don't you go first? 
Sure. Um, yeah, I love that question. That's so great. I was thinking about this the whole time as I was reading, um, like on some subconscious level, I'm like processing the very question that's being asked. So that's that's uh, that's uh, serendipitous. Um, yeah, it's strange to look back at old work and see how much I've changed, but also how much I'm still the same. Um, yeah, like, uh, I'm trying to think of a way to answer this that will be like helpful and smart and not just rambling <laughs> my, my life and my work. But um, I think that as my work has developed and as my life has gone on and as I've moved past um, my older work, um, I don't know, I feel like there, I, I, I start to get a little more precise in my descriptions of things that I'm experiencing and that are happening to me. But at the same time, I feel like um, there's a danger in that. And when I read my old work, I feel this sense of kind of wanting to go back to that because this is a series, a collection of poems that were written you know, before I had any sort of formal education in poetry. And basically I just kind of like taught myself and wrote for myself. And that's what these poems came out of. And they were sort of like happy little accidents or something. I wasn't really like trying to do a thing. And um, I think there's something really special about that when thinking about like your early work as a writer, when you're just doing it for yourself and you don't really know what's gonna happen. You're not like necessarily trying to, you know, feed yourself with, with these words at this point. You're just trying to like sustain yourself spiritually. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, for me, as my writing has become more of something I do to feed myself like physically and, and spiritually, there, there's like a conflict sometimes that, that arises there. Um, of having to articulate yourself in a certain way for a specific audience. Um, whereas earlier on, um, it's really, there's a sense of freedom and you're just drawing from, from everything in your life that you've experienced and you're not necessarily thinking about all of these um, outside structures that inform like the literary world and what happens to your writing once you've actually got it down on the page and wanna get it out there. Um, so that's, that's my, that's my kind of long-winded <laughs> answer to, to that question. That's a, that was a, that's a fantastic response, uh, Jennifer. I think, you know, I think I've become, um, more willing to take risks, uh, as I've gotten, uh, older. Uh, I, I see, you know, I, this book is, it's, it's almost like looking, it's kind of like looking at a high school picture of myself, right? Like, like reading it, like even while I was reading it, I was editing, like I could see a lot of the sort of, you know, the granular kind of the where, where I was having issues with language in it, in the prose. Um, and that even reading it now, I'm like, it feels kind of very restrictive, but I'm still, I'm still very proud of it. It's, I think, um, like I said, I think one of the things I'm, I'm proud of the most is that it really has kind of stood the test of time. Um, now I, I know that um, uh, that my um, I don't really have to sort of engineer big endings the way I felt like I used to in this book. I kind of feel like I, I always like I engineered a huge ending, you know, because I kind of felt like a, a story or a piece of writing needed that. I don't I don't feel like I need to do that anymore. Um, I think that I, yeah, I guess the biggest change has been I'm 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 a lot more willing to take risks with with my writing. Um, my last book, uh, the cruising book is, was very personal. It's, um, uh, I, you know, spent a lot of time uh, writing about my own personal experiences as um, a queer person, you know, dealing with uh, insecurities around my body and um, my relationships with, with various men. Um, and that book taught me more than anything that um, it's important to be honest when you write it's important to be honest in every facet of your life. And I think that's why Jennifer's writing is so uh, resonant to for so many of us is because there's honesty uh, in a lot of the, and there's a vulnerability. And from that vulnerability comes strength, right? So um, I think that's what I've learned is, is to just um, take more risks to, to, to not be afraid, you know? Um, I think when I started, I was really nervous about what people would think and, you know, whether, they were gonna like it, not knowing who they were. Um, now it's like, you know, I, I really don't care about any of that. I just, I'm gonna, cause I'm gonna keep writing regardless. 
Um, so yeah, I think it's just that it's just like, you know, um, part of my language, but now I'm just like, I say, fuck it. You know, I'm just like, I don't care. Um, I'm just going to write whatever the hell I want to write. And, and if you like it, then great. If you don't, then you don't, I'm still going to keep writing it. So, yeah. So I have a question. I know Rima has a question, uh, but I think I'll, I'll ask mine because I feel like it follows up on what both Alex and Jennifer just mentioned. Uh, but I was really struck by Alex's um, six hour writing burst. And I was wondering if you could both maybe talk about the writing process. Um, do you have a set um, time during the day uh, during, which t uh, during which time you write? Um, or do you wait for um, that um, moment of inspiration to start writing? What's the writing process like for both of you? Jennifer, why don't you go? Do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take this one first. Um, the writing process for me is very much a kind of attempt to control chaos. Um, if that, <laughs> I, I, d I don't really have like a traditional relationship to a writing process in the past when I had a lot more free time, I would just kind of like wake up and just write as much as I could, um, like as many days in a row as I could. I tried to have like a very consistent practice like that. But again, it was very like, for me, um, when, I'm, when I'm writing something, it feels like there are a bunch of things kind of floating in the air around me. And then I have like the option to, to pick things and choose from mm -hmm. them. And sometimes there's nothing there. And so I don't write. And then sometimes there's too much there. And so I don't write. Um, but when it's just right, when I feel like I, I have some kind of vision of something, a, a phrase pops into my head or something like that. Um, generally I try to get it written down as quickly as possible. So if I'm like driving on the freeway and I have an idea, you know, I, I pull out my phone and use the, use the voice uh, to, to text feature and, and get that idea down because if you lose it, um, sometimes it's gone forever. And like, for instance, the poem that I read, one of the first poems I read tonight, um, I Dream of Horses Eating Cops. That title was just a line in my notes app for like six months. I just, it was like something that came into my mind while I was driving. And um, I just like got it written down, sat there. I didn't really think about it. Um, and then I was in the mood to write at some point. I felt very inspired. And I went and looked at this line and I was like, okay, I'm going to make a poem out of this. And it just came like, write out like like what you see in the book is like maybe the third draft or something but it was mm -hmm. like that line was sitting there it was percolating it was doing something inside of me when I didn't realize it was happening so I think that um my relationship to to the writing process is very intuitive and um chaotic yes but um there's like a satisfaction that comes from from being able to like ring some kind of significance or meaning out of that chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, my, my process is, you know, at first I used to, when I, when I first started this, this whole, this game of writing and I got into the, the whole publishing thing, um, when I was an undergrad at UC Riverside at Writers Week, I remember these writers would come and, you know, uh, uh, they would always talk about their process, right? And I was always like, you know, I, I sit down and I write from, seven in the morning until 10 at night or, you know, until 10 in the, in the morning. And then I, you know, read the newspaper and drink coffee and go for a walk and then lunch. And then I revise and, and it just was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Like, you know, I, I would write, you know, I wrote this book. I kid you not. Like I would, I would, you know, take classes during the day. I would work a shift at the mall. Um, I usually close the store. So I'd be there till about 10 at night, 1030 on my feet, folding, you know, uh, Marilyn Manson t-shirts and counting out change, you know, uh, balancing my drawer. Then I get in my car and I drive home and I'd sit in front of my computer till like two in the morning, just, you know, pecking away tired. Um, and with my second book, you know, I knew that I needed to write a novel. So I, I wrote my, I wrote a thousand words a day every day. Like that was my aim. Um, my cruising, the cruising book was under a tight deadline. So um, while I was chairing a department when I was teaching at Cal State LA, um, a department that was incredibly dysfunctional. Um, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that, um, <laughs> Ricky. Um, I, I had this book contract and 
um, you know, my publisher was like, we want you to write this book about cruising. And it was crazy. So I, I mean, I was chairing this department and I, I would come home and I would write, you know, any opportunity in any second that I would get. And, um, and that's how I wrote that book. And, and my, this, this novel that I just completed, I started it a couple of years ago and kind of put it on the back burner when the cruising book sort of interrupted and, and cut in line. So I was awarded a fellowship to McDowell uh, last uh, fall. And I spent a month um, in a cabin in New Hampshire with no internet, uh, no Wi-Fi, um, just me and my laptop writing from nine in the morning until five in the evening and they bring my lunch. Um, and I got a lot of writing done that way. And then when I came home and I edited it. So my, my experience is, it's kind of like, like Jennifer's. It's just like, I, I don't have a real, like, I can't say that I have a real, like, like rigid process. Um, I, I, you know, I'm working on another book right now. I haven't touched it in a while, but I know that eventually I'll get to it. Right. And when I do, it's almost like a dam bursting, right? Like right now I'm sort of like holding it all in, but, but the minute I sit down and it's just, right. And, and it's all I can think of and it's all I can do. And it's all I can, it's all I want to tinker with. Um, and, uh, but until then, like right now, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm sitting on this new book that I finished. I'm, you know, getting ready to send it off to my agent and, and, um, and I'm just gonna wait and see, but I have this other project and I know that I'll get to it. Um, I wish I had a clear sort of answer, <laughs> like, but my, my process is all over the place and that's kind of how I like it. Um, I don't wanna be one of those pretentious writers with a capital W who says like, you know, you have to write every day. And um, I, if you do, great, but that's not me. And it's never been me and I don't think it ever will be because my life doesn't afford me that luxury, right? Um, I have two dogs and a partner and we're all working from home and everybody's crabby. Um, my dogs want to be fed and my neighbors are always needing things from me. So it's like, you know, my sisters are calling me all the time and there's always drama. So like, I got to find time to write when, you know, when it's, when it's present, but when it does and it presents itself, it, it's sort of like I'm on this, this high and I, you know, it's hard for me to come down. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, Rich. <laughs> It does, and it makes me feel good about my writing process as well. But, uh, so yeah, I could... <laughs> see, see, that's the thing is if we were just more honest with each other, right, instead of like, you know, writers and these scholars getting up there and saying, you know, I write, you know, a poem yeah. every day or I write, you know, come on, are you serious? Like, really, <laughs> really, you're yeah. bullshit, really, you're just not telling me the truth. <laughs> I agree with Cindy in the chat who says it's cheese man. It is, it's good cheese man. It's also it cheese man to take to heart, you know, as a writer or a thinker and the process that sometimes, you know, we think that we have to follow, but really we have to work at our own pace. And so I appreciate yeah. both Alex and Jennifer um, it, it just beautifully articulating that and um, making me feel good about my writing self. <laughs> um, and so I, there's a question in um, the Q&A that I would uh, like to turn to, Rima. Um, and Rima asks, uh, how would any of the writers here define a literary risk? I think I have some idea, something like the depth of honesty, or is it more technical? Wow, that's a, those are awesome. Rima's asking like, th those are great questions. <laughs> I, I, the writ, gosh. Um, Jennifer, do you wanna go first or do you want me to? I don't want if you want to take a minute to think about it, I, I, I think I have a- Okay, go, go for it, because I'm like thinking, okay. Such a great question. Um, yeah, my mind is like spinning right now, um, thinking about just that idea. Um, yeah, I would say for me personally, the the risk on the page, like craft wise, when it comes to taking risks with, with form and craft is not really as much of a, a worry or concern for me that's like kind of fun actually for me the risk is definitely in like the emotional um honesty part of the of the writing process for instance um i began working on a memoir a couple of years back and i made it about 
15 pages in and I just had to like stop. Um, and I had to put that thing away for like a year. And I was not, I was like literally not okay for like uh, maybe a month after I wrote this thing. And, and um, that was like a really big lesson to me because I think early on in my writing, I was kind of just like, no holds barred, go for it, go for it all, like go for the jugular. Um, and without really like, thinking about my own emotional and mental well-being. And as writers, that's really something that when we think about the risk of emotional honesty, um, we also need to be thinking about like, how do you sustain and care for yourself as you engage in this work? Because when you're writing about these sorts of things, um, you know, you're doing it for yourself, yes, but you're also like offering this to other people to do with what they may. Um, and this work may, you know, help somebody else who's also experienced similar things, or it just may be a good example of like what it means to be vulnerable. But whatever it is, this when you're vulnerable that way, you're offering something. Mm -hmm. And you need to think about like, how is this affecting you? And, and how do you care for yourself as you're like, engaging in this act of care by sharing your work? Um, and I think that that's something that we forget about and we kind of romanticize like the, the sad starving artist who's like struggling to get by. Um, but I think that, um, gosh, this question really got away from me. There is definitely a risk there. And the emotional risk is, is big when you're working with really serious subject matter. And it's really important to make sure that as writers, we're taking care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, that's, 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 that's a fantastic answer, Jennifer, I think, you know, you're absolutely right when, you know, the, the, because we're reliving a lot of trauma, right, we're reliving, especially those of us that come from communities, you know, that have experienced a lot of it. So we're inviting that trauma back into our bodies in a lot of ways and reliving it. Um, you know, the, bo the body remembers those things, right, it's encoded in our DNA. So it's important that we that we do take care of ourselves when we when we write. Um, I remember uh, when I was writing my second book, The Five Acts of Diego Leon. It was um, it's a, it was a historical novel, um, and there was part of it takes place during a really bloody um, uh, civil war between the church and the state in Mexico in the 30s, called the Cristero Rebellion, when the church. Um, the Catholic Church, you know, uh, because the government was uh, really uh, trying to control the power and the influence of the Catholic Church in, in the country, um, uh, the, the church took up arms and started fighting against these um, um, uh, troops that the, that the government was sending out. Uh, there was one account that I read of a group of um, Cristeros, they were called Cristeros, um, the, the, the ones that were sort of aligning with the church. Um, uh, commandeered a, um, a train that was um, on the tracks. They stopped it. They thought there was gold on it, I think. And um, they didn't find anything. And so what they ended up doing was they ended up locking the car doors. There were people, there were just, you know, travelers on the train and they doused it with gasoline and lit it on fire. And I wrote a similar scene in, in my novel about that. And I still remember it was in the middle of the night and I had to just like stop and tell myself like, what am I doing? Why am I recalling these things? Um, and I was walking around my house at like two in the morning in my robe and my dogs were looking at me like, what the hell is wrong with you? Um, I think risk, you know, for me, it's different with every book. It's different with every single book. The risk is, is, is never the same. Um, that's because the process is always teaching me something different about myself. Uh, one of the frustrating things about writing is that you, it didn't matter how many books you write, you're still learning about it, right? You're still, you're still, you're, you have to start again, all, you know, at page one with that first poem or that first essay or that first chapter, right? So the process is always teaching you something. So for me, the risks are always different. Uh, with the cruising book, the risk was, I'm basically bearing my soul. Like I'm talking about some very intimate things that I did uh, in places with, with, with men that, you know, would make my mom like, you know, want to probably like, you know, tie me to a chair and have a priest exercise me, right? Like, I mean, I, it, it was really personal and it was really taxing on me. Um, 
with this new novel that I'm, that I'm working on is different. The risk is, you know, I'm trying to depict a very specific segment of the Latino community and I'm looking at the ways in which labor um, taxes the body, the, the brown body, right? Um, I'm looking at the spectacle of sport um, and, and, and sexuality, right? And so I'm sort of dealing with these very heavy topics. So for me, the risk is how accurate am I depicting this, right? With the next book, the risk is gonna be different. Um, and that's because the process is never the same. And that's, that's why I like it. And that's why it, make, it frustrates me, but the frustration is always what, what gets me back in the chair, trying to, trying to figure it out and unlock it, right? My favorite musicians and artists are people who from one like album to the next or one painting to the next are always doing something different. They're always evolving. Uh, so um, that's what I try to do with my writing. So I have, I have a question that sort of piggybacks on that. I'm thinking about the, your chosen genres because, you know, Jennifer, you've, it seems like you've been drawn to poetry and that your work is very raw and you put so much of yourself out there. And Alex, it seems like you've been drawn more to fiction, um, although now you've also written a memoir. And I think about, um, you know, how much to share and thinking about how, um, like, what would you advise others who are interested in writing about how how do you decide how much is okay to share versus and what you can tolerate in this process of putting it all on on paper and out there for the world versus you know fiction is is a way to kind of bury those things and layer it so you don't have to necessarily put yourself out there as much so i, I guess that's yeah does that make sense that, that makes total sense yeah okay Jennifer, do you want to go again? Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to, um, uh, I didn't want to like jump in or cut you off. No, but, go uh, ahead. <laughs> okay, so the question was about um, the the sort of like my my genre of poetry and how that. Um, I'm sorry. Do you mind like kind of restating? No, sure. Well, it's about it. It piggybacks on the idea of risk and how much to share of your own um, personal history and identity in your work versus how much to you know bury it in something else in, in fiction I feel like I um am perhaps like not the best person to answer this question as a chronic oversharer um, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that actually speaks to what you're, you're saying though Katie what I really liked you said like about um sharing up to like what you can tolerate and that's what it's really about it's about like personally how much um you know how much is too much detail to give for like my own mental health. Um, and I don't think I always had the best grasp on that. Um, and I think that that's something I've gotten better at as time has gone on. And um, I think a lot of it is just paying attention to yourself. And um, you're like, as Alex so um, aptly put it, like the body holds all of the things that you've mm -hmm. experienced. And so when you're engaging with these things, it's, it's important to pay attention to your body as you're writing and um, getting these lines out there. Maybe you write a line and you feel a twinge and you think, then no, this is, this is too personal or this is not something I'm ready or willing to put out there and engage with yet. And I think if that's the case, then you need to listen to your body and, and do that thing. And like your health comes first is the theme of my answers tonight um, when it comes to your writing. And I mean, in all things, obviously, but um, I think that with poetry versus something like memoir, it's a little bit easier to, to use the poem as a space to compress things and to, to bury things and to let things kind of sit beneath the surface and, and be present there, but not necessarily be like revealing themselves and showing themselves in the way that a memoir kind of, I feel like asks the writer to do. Um, mm -hmm. So I do think that there's something about poetry that is both like really deeply, deeply vulnerable, like a, like a knife to the heart, but also like a warm blanket at the same time. Or maybe it's like it's like the thing that wounds you and the bandage at the same time. It's 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 a very interesting and curious relationship for sure. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, no, that, that's very very well said, uh, Jennifer. I think 
you know, for me, you know, nonfiction, I can be, you know, I don't have to beat around the bush <laughs> with nonfiction. I, I can, I can basically say what I feel, right? You know, I, I, I think this is dumb, or I think this is great, or, you know, I, I could be very candid in a way, I think that um, it, fiction's all about, um, you know, subtlety. It's all about talking around things. It's all about, um, you know, uh, building tension and creating uh, a narrative structure uh, that's gonna engage a reader. Uh, nonfiction, you know, you can, you can say it. You can just, you know, you can say I was angry about something or you can say, you know, this made me feel this way. Um, I, I think that it, it, it's up to, it's, it's always hard to, to sort of be able to articulate to a young writer um, how to know when, you know, it's TMI, like it's too much information and, and, and how to, I, I think that that's, that that's something that a writer has to gauge for themselves, right? I can't, you know, I've had plenty of people come to me and say things like, you know, I had recount these really traumatic experience that they had and, and tell me that they, that they wanna write about them. And, and my, my response to them is, well, what, like, what have you read um, along the same lines of that? Um, well, you know, not much or nothing. Okay, well then we need to start there because you need to look and see the, the body of literature that exists uh, that's already present that you want to be in a conversation with, and you you have to know what your what your your limits are. I can't I can't teach you that, right? Um, and that's something that Susan told me early on. I remember she said, you know, I can teach you about like how to write good dialogue. I can teach you how to write, you know, good good characters. But but the way you describe it or your desire to want to do it, I I can't teach you that. You just have to be able to to know when it's right in, in you. Um, I, I, I think I'd say to someone, um, you know, if, if, you're, if your body and your senses are telling you to not write that yet, if it's hard, first of all, like if you're writing it and you feel like, Ugh, like it sounds terrible and the sentences are horrible, then that's your first indication that, well, maybe you should just put it away for now and go do something else, right? I think, it, as Jennifer said, you do have to listen to your body. You, you know, um, you know, you 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 come to writing with everything, right? With your entire body, with your, you know, your bones and your liver and your blood and your brain and like everything, your heart. Um, and so you have to be, as a writer, I think, as an artist, you have to be um, cognizant and aware of your own uh, um, limitations, like what you're willing to reveal and when you're willing to reveal it. Like I could say to you, oh my goodness, that experience that you had that you shared with me is so powerful, you should write about it. But that doesn't mean that you're gonna be able to sit down and do it, right? I, I couldn't write my book, my cruising book and a lot of those personal things uh, until that moment presented itself, right? Until it was like, here, I'm going to write about my experiences, like hooking up with men in public. Like, I'm going to talk about some very personal things. I couldn't do that five, six years ago, eight years ago, right? It, it, it took that moment, right? And it, it took the, the moment that I was in as a writer to be able to sit down and say, okay, now's the time to write this. And um, I'm going to be okay if I do it, right? But yeah, as Jennifer said, a lot more succinctly than I can. Because see, that's what poets do. They they say it succinctly. You you know you 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 bring you, you bring your body to it. You you have to be able to listen to your own um, body to know when to reveal the things that are that are painful. And if you're not ready for it right now, that's okay. That's not a failure. It's just your defense mechanism that we're all born with, telling you not not yet. You know you'll get to it, but not right now. Okay, I have a couple of questions and, and I know questions are coming up as this uh, conversation's unfolding and it's such a, a wonderful conversation. Um, so I wanna hear how Hot Topic influenced your writing, Alex. And Jennifer, I'd like to hear, cause you know, folks are talking about the rawness and the pain in your poems, but I also see a lot of humor in the, in some of the voices too, and maybe that's like speaking as a traumatized person, like sometimes you have to freaking laugh. 
Um, Cause what else is there to do? <laughs> um, and I'm thinking about the poem about the sun, right? Like, do I care about this poem? Yeah, I care, I care a lot about this. Poem. Like that makes me laugh. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the tapestries that you all weave in your writing to encapsulate all these different emotions. Mm. Right? I could, I could, if if I could jump in, Jennifer, if that's okay. Um, how hot topic sort of <laughs> featured into this? Well, I mean that section that I read, right, where where Bedlow's like taking inventory and like, you know, counting things, and then she's counting out her. That's like taken straight out of my experiences working retail, right? That right there. Um, another thing also that I that I um, that I I came to realize, you know, in my years of working retail is. One of the things that um, that I became sort of aware of um, was the way in which, like, I would have customers, um, regular customers, coming back to see me because they liked like a combination of like a cape and a velvet shirt that I put together, or like whatever, like, and and they would reveal things to me about their their lives or about their experiences, right? And, and that's something that Bedla does a lot, right? Her customers come and they, and she knows how to listen, right? So I, I kind of learned that that skill, I guess, uh, working retail, which is kind of strange, working at a mall selling, um, you know, body jewelry and like fake fangs to like goth kids. Okay, um, so to answer your great question, and about like the role of humor in my writing. Um, yeah, that's something that's really important to me. That's kind of always been something that I, that I, I don't wanna say aim for because every poem is different, but it's something that I hope will, will be called for in each particular poem I'm writing. Like if I start writing a poem, I'm like, please let there be a moment of, of levity in this thing. I, I really need it. Um, and I think that's what it speaks to. It's, it's, it's representative of the way that traumatized people cope, right? Like we use humor, um, we laugh at our pain because like you said, like what else, what else is there to do? Um, and I think that if I'm being honest, that instinct in my writing emerges from a place of, of wanting to kind of offer um, like a safe space to myself within my own poem. Um, I'm looking at this question in the chat about like, how do you come back from, from writing about trauma and pain? And I think that one of the ways that I've done that using like humor and sarcasm and like lines that are meant to offer some levity um, is that, that that's a way for me to, to start to engage in that process of coming back from the trauma before I'm even like all the way in it. Um, and I'm like building that into the poem so that I don't get to the end of the poem and feel like, oh God, now I have to go, go away somewhere for a couple of weeks or something. Um, so I think that, yeah, the humor in that sense is, is really essential, um, depending on the piece that, that it's being used within, um, in order to do that work of, of. I mean, it's selfish. It, it, it's a selfish instinct, but I, I'm, I'm really happy when I hear that people enjoy it and that it resonates. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I, I think that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, I think, I think just sort of adding a little, if I, if I could add to what Jennifer said, I think, you know, one of the things, you know, when I wrote my, my, my nonfiction book, um, I can't tell you how many, uh, you know, gay men, uh, approached me and, and said, you know, thank you for, you know, for writing these experiences. I, I had similar experiences and I never, you know, shared them with anyone, right? And I think you're always, um, you know, you, you revisit your trauma and you write it uh, because you hope that it can make the world a little clearer for somebody else, right? I think it was Dorothy Allison and it was something very similar that, that Jennifer said. I think Dorothy Allison said, um, I, wanna, I wanna break the world's heart and then heal it, right? Like it, it, when they asked her about like, what does she want her writing to do? And, and that's, that's kind of what I think what we do is like, we wanna, we wanna be able to break your heart and then, and then heal it. And like Jennifer said, you know, cut you, but then like put a warm blanket over you, right? Um, I think that's what we're all trying to do, right? Not because we're like into pain or anything, right? 
but but because we we know that that there is this sort of catharsis that comes through the struggle, right? That we experience, uh, and that we hope that um, that that an individual can be changed by our own experiences the way we have been changed by them, so that we feel less alone. Thank you so much, um, Jennifer and Alex, um, for this amazing conversation. And um, I know there's another question in the Q&A, but we don't have time. But you can attend our discussion, um, you know, where you can discuss more of these questions and what was brought up um, during today's event. Um, Katie put in a link to the survey, and it would be super helpful if you could take, um, take that survey. It'll um, give us the opportunity um, to hear your experiences about this event. I'm actually going to copy and paste also um, the link to the participating libraries. Typically, when you go to like events like this, people say, go buy their book. The book is already bought. All you have to do is like go to your library and pick it up. And how awesome is that? Like what's better than a free book or two? So um, thank you all for being here on your Friday evening. Um, please stay safe and healthy. And um, we hope to see you at the discussions of these books. Yep. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Rachel, for being an excellent moderator and Ricky and Jennifer and Alex and so many thought provoking questions and for being a role model for all these other writers who um, are struggling to express themselves too. So thank <laughs> you for putting yourselves out there like that. Um, we will uh, see you all again in, okay. yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone. You. Bye. Bye. Bye everybody. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Have a good night.